Hi, welcome to our webcast. My name is Bernie Daler, and my guest is Lenny Esposito. Thanks Hi, Lenny. for having me on. Thank you for having me on, Bernie. Appreciate it. I'm a former evangelical Christian, and I actually even preached a gospel at one point on the internet and TV. And Lenny is a evangelical Christian apologist, and so we're just going to have a little free-flowing discussion. Um, Lenny, I guess we'll um, open up a little bit. You just uh, contributed to a book. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, thanks so much. The book is called uh, True Reason, uh, answering, uh, basically confronting the irrationality of the new atheism. And it was written initially um, in a response to kind of some of the movements that were going on where folks like Sam Harris and, and Richard Dawkins and others were claiming to have the high ground on rationality. And we wanted to say that not only are there good reasons for Christianity, we think Christianity offers some of the best reasons for a, a thoughtful life. And that's what the book's about. Uh, we have contributors from folks like William Lane Craig, Sean McDowell, uh, Timothy McGrew, um, Carson Weinauer, um, Tom Gilson, uh, and many others who have uh, put together uh, 18 chapters basically on the uh, different arguments that are popular against uh, by the new atheists against Christianity today. Uh, I contributed to one of those chapters. The chapter that I contributed to was the argument from reason that uh, the rationality uh, of um, basically the, the idea that reason itself must be grounded in something other than naturalism. So, but it's coming out uh, in just a couple of weeks and we're excited to see it. So. Okay, so if you ordered on Amazon, you're not going to get it for a couple of weeks? Then. Yeah, the release date is March 1st. Uh, they may do a soft, you know, shipment okay. early, but I'm, we're, we're waiting any, any day now. So. You mentioned um, the atheists claim to have the high ground on uh, rational, rational, what was it, on... Um, rationality, yeah. On, rationality. On. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that as an atheist. I, I think we do have the high ground. So okay. uh, what, what do you have to say? And, and you know, so, so you wrote the chapter on um, the argument from reason, which I've... Right. I, I was going to say I've never heard that before, but it sounds like uh, Plantinga's kind of argument. Planning has offered a version yeah. of it. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, really popularized it first, uh, and um, Victor Ruppert has done a lot of work in this area and others. Um, basically, the, the idea is that if, if all consciousness is, or if all our um, conscious experience is, is based in physical processes, if our brains are nothing more than the grand result of an evolutionary process, then our brains are those kinds of things that are created in order for um, the organism to best survive. If I understand the, the, the neo-Darwinian concept of, of uh, evolution as we hold it today, as most people hold it today, uh, the idea is that uh, there's blind indifference as to what kind of mutations happen. The only mutations that stick around are those that prove beneficial to the organism in the sense that it allows the organism to survive and reproduce. Okay, sure. So what's the problem though? Well, the problem becomes in the fact that survival value doesn't care one whit whether its beliefs are true or not. Oh, see, there's a, there's a well, okay, there's a major point of disagreement right there, then. Okay, well, well, let me let me kind of unpack this a little bit more. Maybe you can understand it. Take your sensory experiences, uh, and I use this example. In the book. Um, you could be walking along, uh, dehydrated, in the middle of uh, the Nevada desert. By the way, you, your sound your sound is really breaking up. I don't know oh, if, if there's it, some I kind mean, of major static. Okay, let me see if I can get a little closer. That might help. So. If you're walking in the Nevada desert and you look in the distance and you see a pool of water, um, your survival instinct would say go towards that pool of water. That's a, an appropriate thing to do. Uh, so that's what you would do. But when you get there, that same sense, your, your vision, would then say, hey, there's no water here. So you have the same source data, your senses, your eyes. 
when you're in one spot, they say water's there. When you're in another spot, they say water isn't. See, so just because your sensory value is is giving you an input doesn't mean that that's correct. Now, the problem becomes if your mind, if your brain is all that you have to reason with, your brain has developed much in the same way your eyes have, and it could give you a false impression that may help you survive, but yet may not be true. For example, if you were to go, um, I don't know, running, and you think running is, is the right thing to do because um, it, it exercises the heart and gets you in shape, you know, that may offer an opportunity for you to live longer. Or you could say, well, I go running because I'm faster than the fat spirits that attack my body. And as long as I'm running, I'm escaping the fat spirits, and that's why I live longer. Doesn't matter which belief you have, the outcome of you running would be that you live longer. So survival is not necessarily equal to truth value. Survival only means that you've chosen an option that allows you to survive. Okay, well, and that's the problem. All right. Well, let me give you. I mean, to me, the the solution is actually very simple. So I, I don't really see what the problem is. According to evolution, it's kind, there's kind of an arms race. For example, the the cheetah and the antelope. Right? The, the, the antelope gets faster, so the cheetah gets faster. The cheetah gets longer teeth. Uh, you know, and so there's like an arms race in nature. Now, okay. the brain is one of those organs that is actually in an arms race also. And you know, uh, animals are always after each other. So the smarter animal is the one who's going to be able to outwit the other one. So with humans. You know, this is why when we create new technology, one of the very first things we do is weaponize it because if we don't, we can get destroyed by our enemies. And when you weapon, so, so all this new technology, for example, nuclear technology, space technology, all of this stuff, it gets weaponized because that's our number one uh, thing. It's an existential threat to our survival. So, and this is why science is so powerful because science gives us a method to know what's real by independent observation, other people reproduce the experiment, and also removing subjectivity. For example, in a scientific experiment, they'll never say like, does this look like it's red to you or blue to you because it's too subjective. Instead, they'll measure the wavelength of light and say like, well, this, this is giving off a frequency of that or this frequency. That way it's more exact. So science is basically in the business of removing subjectivity to remove all that problem. It's a tool we have developed and the reason why it's so powerful and we, we know it's good is because it works. Well, I, I don't discount science and, and the fact that it works. The problem is that we assume that what we're talking about are true values. And the question from a, from a philosophical standpoint is how do we assume that if our consciousness is nothing more than a physical process, a, a chemical process? You don't mix chemicals together and get truth. In other words, the physical sciences are are kind of cause and effect, but they're just mechanics. They're but not, see, nobody, they're not but nobody, with truth value. Okay, but see, nobody is saying that the chemical processes are generating truth, but the right. brain works by chemical processes. The mind emerges from the brain, and the mind can evaluate truth. I mean, just like a computer. A computer, they have self, like the Google car, for example. It can mm -hmm. navigate itself. And that's a that's a form of understanding the truth of the world. It can go in well, unknown territory and, it, and and figure out where to go. And and those are all total physical, physical. Con there's there's nothing supernatural there going on. Right, it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the computer has any clue as to what truth is. The, the the famous example was by philosopher John Searle. He gave this Chinese box analogy, where he says, "What if you you know imagine you're a man, an American locked in a box." box is filled with books. You don't read a lick of Chinese. You know this, the door has two slots. And every day in one of the slots comes a card. Card is filled with Chinese symbols, right? You have no idea what those Chinese symbols say, but you do know that if you look up a book and you look up the symbols, it gives you a second set of symbols to write down below it. So the Chinese symbols are on the top. You find that passage. You write down the second set of Chinese symbols on the bottom, and you stick it through the second slot in the door. Okay, you have no idea what you've done. You just know that if you write, if you have this set of symbols, you write that set of symbols. Your audio is breaking up again. Okay, uh, sorry. I'll try to I'll try to be as as loud as possible. It might be a 
connection issue. But okay, so here's here's the problem with this. The people who are sticking the cards in the box are asking some of the world's deepest questions. And when they pull that, when they get the answer, they're amazed at the thoughtfulness and the reflection and the wisdom of the person inside the box who's feeding them the answers. But you inside the box, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. You're just copying characters. That's what a computer does. It says, if I receive this input, I get this output. The computer has no knowledge whatsoever. It has no consciousness. That's the difference between consciousness and a mechanical system. And, and if your brain is merely an electromechanical system, it's no better than the guy in the box. But, he has no knowledge okay. of what truth actually is. But, you know, your example of a computer is actually a very primitive computer. It's not like a self-learning computer. or It's not like a learning computer. They have learning robots that learn from their environment. Right. But learning computers, all they do is have more and more complex ways of saying, if I receive this input, I get this output. Consciousness does not emerge from a computer. It's something completely different than that. Yeah, but, yeah, right, sure. I mean, that's the way we are, too. If you do this, if you do this input, you get this output, and then you put two and two together. For example, the Google car, I think, is a perfect example. It goes in a totally unknown area. And it, it looks around and avoids uh, people. It can avoid ditches. It can avoid everything. It, it can go from um, th that's the DARPA. They had this uh, test and you know see which cars can go through this obstacle course. It's like something like 80 miles long, I believe, and but all again, kinds of ditches and logs and everything. Well, and again, that is a mechanical construct. It, a mechanical construct can't come up with a brand new idea. It can merely refine the ideas that it has already been given. It's something different. Mechanical constructs can't feel. The idea of love is not something that you can merely reduce to inputs and outputs. It just doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, there's something uniquely different about, about consciousness. Even Thomas Nagel, who's an atheist, and one of the world's best philosophers, has held to this. He believes that thought and reasoning he says, are correct or incorrect in virtue of something independent of the thinker's beliefs, even independent of the community of thinkers to which he belongs. Uh, so he, and he holds that the natural internal stance of human life assumes that there is a real world, but we can't know that with merely physical processes. Well, let me, let me tell you, you know, from an atheistic standpoint, I look at nature and I can see all the different species. You know, there's mm -hmm. humans and then there's a little bit lower consciousness in Let's say, for example, the uh, chimps, and then th there, there's also different levels of consciousness, you know, for uh, dogs and cats and fish, and then down to a slug, for example, and an ant and all that. So you can see the gradations of consciousness. Now, do you acknowledge that there's consciousness in a, for example, a dog and a dolphin and a, and a chimp? Yes, I would. I would acknowledge that they are conscious living beings. Uh, I think their consciousness isn't a, a, a gradation of human consciousness. I think we have attributes that are wholly unique to humanity from all of the other animals in the world. But there is oh. some level of consciousness there, absolutely. You know, here's one of the, here's one of the bottom line, I think, problems. Uh, we have two totally different foundations we're building upon uh, mm -hmm. in, from a scientific standpoint. One is, is I'm firmly convinced that humans evolved from other animals. Mm -hmm. And I think you are probably largely reject that, is that right? Yeah, I've not found any good reason to hold to the neo-Darwinian synthesis. I think there's four primary problems with it. One is the leap to life, the fact that abiogenesis is not explained, there's no good models for it. Uh, I don't see, it. I, I use the analogy of uh, Winston Churchill. There's an old story about Churchill who, you know, was they were told him, hey, the, the Germans are attacking in the English Channel with their U-boats, and we can't we can't catch them with our planes. And uh, Churchill says, well, the solution is easy. You just boil the seas, and all the U-boats have to surface. And they said, how are we going to boil the seas? And Churchill replied, well, I'm just the, I'm the idea man. The rest is an engineering detail, you know. And as an engineer, you'd probably appreciate that. But um, well, well, so, well, the bottom line. But you know, I, I I don't need you to go over all the different alternatives. But I mean, essentially, there's either creationism. I mean, either you were created by a miracle by God from scratch, or there's you you came from other animals from descent, right? Those are the only two. Possibilities. Well, yeah. I mean, there there are there are other possibilities that other people 
offer. There's you know theistic evolution and things like that. I think. But that's that still. But, but theistic evolution is still human descent from it's other human, animals. It's human descent, but and, well, and then there's great that. But some people believe in progressive creationism, things like that. Which is still, so, which is still a creation by a miracle at one instant, though. Yeah, I wouldn't say miracle. It's a it's a creative act on the part of God. That's not necessarily suspending natural law. That's injecting something new into the into the scene. So well, uh, well, for example, uh, the old Earth creationists. We we know yeah. uh, you know reasons to believe in Fazel Rana and stuff. I mean, right. so th that's what you're talking about. Progressive res um, progressive creationism, Creation. where basically at some point uh, God said, "Okay, I'm going to make humans now," and He yeah. did it from scratch. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, however he Not, did it, he did it. Yeah. Right, but but it it wasn't uh, uh, a a human coming from the birth of any other animal. Yeah, I I I don't. It's not necessary to for for me. I mean, that's a side point, but it's it's not necessary to to posit that a human was birthed from another animal, or that I, I don't believe that there was a natural process that spawned humanity. Like I said, I believe that humanity was was specifically a unique creation of God. I I, I do hold to that. So um, that, well, you know, well, you know, Lenny. One thing I've said, I just get your reaction on this. You know, this this could be kind of inflammatory, but I I believe that you know. As an apologist, you're you're not even in the game until you could accept evolution. This is people like um, Dinesh D'Souza and William Lane Craig. They won't argue evolution because of the evidence for it. And so, you know, until you until you get there, you're not even uh, up to modern science standards. No, that's not true. That's that's neither that's neither true nor factual. It's yes, Craig won't argue evolution, but he doesn't argue. As a matter of fact, he had a debate against Francisco Ayala on the concept of human evolution. Uh, I think he holds to something akin to Stephen Meyer when I've talked with him, and, and Meyer has written two great books, um, Signature in the Cell, and then la lastly Darwin's Doubt, talking about the Cambrian explosion. Uh, but evolution has, as a theory, really only works at the 30,000 foot level. In, in the details, it really has, there is no model. There is no model to say how do you go from what kind of genome changes happened in order to make the whale go from a land-bearing creature to a sea-bearing creature? Where did the genome actually change? How did that happen in the span of time that we know that the genome changed, given uh, that whatever it is, the five to seven million years the fossil record shows for that? Richard Sternberg has done a lot of work in that area. How do we get from scales to feathers if dinosaurs are supposed to be the progenitors of birds? You know, how did the genome actually change? There's no models for that. Those don't exist. Okay. There's a missing well, mechanism there. Well, let me, let me give the, I mean, there's, there's a real simple answer here. Um, evolution is both a science, uh, is both a fact and a theory. The fact is that it happened, that humans evolved from other creatures, and all species came from other species. The theory is in how it happened. For example, Darwin didn't know anything about DNA, and he actually thought that everything came from descent, whereas now we know there's other mechanisms such as horizontal gene transfer, which has nothing to do at all with descent. So there's a lot of factors that are still being discovered, and, and this is how it happened, but the fact that it happened, um, let me say this too, the fact that it happened could easily be seen in the DNA. There's a field called genomics where you look at the different species and you, for example, the whale and um, other land animals, you look at the DNA sequence and you can see uh, how they're related. And so it's, it's so obviously they're related or else God is, if God really did create these individually, then he's trying to make it look like they're related. So he'd be a deceiver not, God. Which not would not be, necessarily. I mean, two different builders can build two different buildings using the same kind of uh, main blueprint. I mean, builders don't change the way. You know, I don't care who the house builder was who built your house. I don't know, but I bet you he laid his stud 16 inches on center, just like my house builder laid my house. I mean, the the fact that you find a good design and you use it over and over again neither proves deceit nor does it prove uh, common descent. It merely yeah, proves that it's a good design and we keep using it. Okay, but the, but the issue isn't the design is similar. The issue is basically seeing the footsteps of the scent, for example, pseudogenes. Um, and I, I think I mentioned before there's a, a scientist named Dennis Vienema. He's an evangelical Christian, and he has a long YouTube series on this going over all the DNA evidence. But it, it's kind of like, for example, somebody saying like, oh, I teleported to my house from my work. And it's like, wait a minute, we, we see 
footprints in the snow leading up to your door and we have tire tracks in the driveway and it's like oh yeah well that doesn't prove anything but no it does prove something so these footprints are in the DNA but the but again I, I think there's a lot more that we don't know than we do we're finding out just recently that things like junk DNA aren't junk at all um, th th those pseudo genes I think uh, can be carried by common viruses I mean there's there's all kinds of things that we just don't know yet. And, and yeah, genomics is not my field, so I don't want to speak too, too deeply into it. But I will say that without a model to say that it's a fact, that's a huge stretch. I mean, that was the same uh, response that was given in the 1920s and 30s about the, the universe being an eternal universe, a steady state theory universe. I mean, it was just fact by most of the scientists of that day. And it just didn't make sense, though, because when you find out that the stars are actually, you know, expanding away from one another, so the, the idea of the universe lasting in an eternal state uh, just doesn't pan out. So I would be very careful claiming that uh, evolution is that grounded in fact when there's no model for how it happens. I mean, this is the way science works. It's almost like you're saying, you know, cold fusion. Right? We, we did the tests in the lab and we found cold fusion. Well, yeah, but if you can't replicate it, if you can't make it happen again, if you don't know the exact way it all works, how can you really call it science? It's, well, the thing, it's, yeah, but, but the thing with replication is you can never replicate DNA because, or um, evolution because it happened in history once. And if you rewound the tape, you could re it could happen differently. So, for example, if they actually could discover how to make life from non-life in the lab, that is just still just a hypothesis. We we just know that's one right. possible way. We don't know if that's the actual way it happened. So even right. then, and, you can say they, like it's just an idea. Well, and they haven't again. They haven't been able to even come close. They it's not even it's not even in the ballpark yet. They're not even at the starting line on that one. Richard Lensky is doing a lot of great work with E. coli bacteria, uh, tracing their evolutionary development because E. coli is one of the bacteria that that reproduce the fastest. So he has. And what he's finding is that it takes about 30,000 generations before you get any appreciable change. Well, if you map 30,000 generations out on a larger mammal species, a dog or a human, you run out of time, even with a four point, you know, whatever, four billion year old Earth. You know, 30,000 generations, that would be from the first life until us now. It's just, there's just not enough time for it to happen. Looking at how fast uh, genomic or uh, genes um, will mutate and and create those new random generations. Well, those are those are just things we're still trying to figure out in science. I mean, for example, I can tell you as but an engineer. But that's not fair. You can't well, you can't no, wipe away the problems me, and only focus on. <laughs> no, let me give you an example. As an engineer, uh, you can have a problem with a laptop that has an intermittent memory problem. But when you do debug, you can actually write a program. If you think, let's say, that memory is in a certain area, you could hammer that one little area, and then you get the problem just like every every second you can get it and then you can put it on an oscilloscope or something and look at what's going on uh -huh. so in the in the lab if someday there's a breakthrough about how we see how evolution has you know we can easily control it or manipulate it we may be able to do quick quick experiments but we're still trying to figure out the basics I mean we just got we, right. we read all the human all the DNA uh, just in the year 2000 and they're still trying to understand what it all does there, there's right. still a lot of genes I they agree. don't even know what they do I absolutely so. agree and that's why this 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 theory we should hold everyone should hold it tentatively because there's there's more question marks than there are certainties no but and, yeah, but and as a fair scientist any fair scientist would say we have to hold these 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 facts that we learn tentatively because we're trying to figure them out and we may discover something tomorrow that overturns the apple cart again well definitely all science is tentative but the point is what I, I, I still believe that the DNA record in, in the field of genomics shows how everything is related through footsteps of descent. You know, for example, the genes, I mean, they're, they're obvious pseudogenes. There may be a, a use for it. For example, I have a shed in my backyard. This is what the scientist says, the Christian scientist. I have a shed in my backyard. That, that has a certain purpose I made it for. If that thing burned down, you can come back 20 years later and still see there's some kind of purpose for it. Like maybe the birds are making a nest out of it or the snakes live in there or something made a use out of it. But that doesn't mean that that's the purpose of it. And so, for example, you know, right now we can't make our own vitamin C in our body because we have a uh, chopped up enzyme for vitamin C. Well, you know, gorillas have the same problem. 
but when you go down to other life forms, you can see the correct gene code and it works for them. So because our, our gene code is hacked up because of copy errors, you know, we survived without it and we didn't need it. So that's an example. I mean, for the olfactory senses alone, you know, the smelling ability, there's supposed to be like thousands of pseudogenes. I mean, the body is just, there's just many, many well, thousands of, of, of junk junk in there. So I, I think it's definitely there's, there's junk in there. Well, you can probably, there's, I, I think you can build a human, you could probably build a human out of clean DNA without all the extra garbage in there. It'd be a lot more efficient. Well, I, and, and we don't, like I said, we're finding out that that, that junk DNA is actually performing purposes. It's, you know, the, the idea of, of how the, um, how the protein folds happen and things like that. There's a lot of secondary structures, and again, it's not my field of expertise, but there's a lot of data that's just finding out that this junk DNA isn't as much junk as you thought after all. But what we do see is most of the mutations that you talk about, even within genetics, don't lead to a new feature. They lead to a, either a breakdown or a missing feature. They, in other words, they're they're either detrimental or neutral. They're not they're not adding new information to the organism. That's the thing I've never seen. I've never seen a mutation that actually adds new abilities. It may uh, reduce the ability of say this E. coli to uh, be able to block citrate and so it can absorb citrate. Now it can eat it. Things like that. But it's not. We don't see these mutations that say, okay, you used to have legs, now you have feathers, or now you have wings, you know, things like that. To build new new processes, whole new areas of a, of a uh, organism is, is much more complex than I think um, is being represented in the, in the study at that time. Well, you know, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, the, trying to figure out how new things arise is... Uh, a big weak spot now trying to figure that out or, or a weak spot in our understanding, scientific understanding. But still, if you look at genomics, the pathways there, uh, the, the footprints of descent are so obvious that they cannot be ignored. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll put a link in the video here to Dennis Vienema, who's a Christian evangelical in science, and he has a tutorial on this on YouTube, and it's for the layman, and it, it just goes from A to Z on all the evidence for DNA, it's just for people who want to see that. Well, um, did, I'll, I'll give you like a few more seconds if you want to wrap this up, and then we'll ask somebody uh, if they want to ask a question. We'll ask. Yeah, somebody, a couple somebody, of questions check. would be great. Yeah. Well, I would just say that um, you know, in in first of all, check out the book, uh, True Reason: Confronting the Irrationality of New Atheism. It obviously goes into a lot more depth than I can I can do justice here in just half an hour. Uh, I think it's got some good chapters in it. I think uh, I think it'll cause people to think, which is always a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, the problem of consciousness is is going to be something even more difficult to deal with. Uh, even you know, how do you get immaterial consciousness from material, uh, you know, non-thinking matter? What is consciousness? Consciousness is the kind of thing that can't even be explained materially. Uh, it has to be immaterial. It, it's something that is separate from uh, material circumstances because it doesn't have the same properties as material items. So there, there's all kinds of things that you can talk about there, but uh, I, I think the book is, is helpful, and uh, I think that there's uh, more we can actually talk about, even on the philosophical side uh, of the argument, as well as the uh, maybe the, the uh, evolutionary side. Okay, well, like I said earlier, sometimes I'm still getting used to Google Plus here, but uh, we had one person, Timothy, come on earlier, so we were able to frame him up and, and test him out. So I think next time uh, I'll um, I'll do this with other people. We'll give him a chance. So, uh, yeah, Timothy, um, let me see. All right, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, looks like we can hear you. So what did you Great, think? Do you have a question? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me this uh to, to listen. You guys are both very well versed and it's uh, enlightening to hear such uh, good opinions on both sides. Hey, I was perusing the Reader's Digest this month and uh, physicist Alan Lightman had stated this and I just wanted to try to wrap with this. Science can never prove or disprove the existence of God. If God does exist, he surely exists outside of rational thought and outside the physical universe. 
I just had to deal with the, the rational thought aspect. Where do we draw the line on what rational thought is? You know, if Coco the chimpanzee can mimic sign language and, you know, say, hey, I want that banana by using a sign, is he thinking right. rationally? I guess, I guess that's my question to both you gentlemen, and thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll mute your sound here now. Yeah. Um, well, two things. One thing is, I just, I, I, I actually, uh, this is a project I need to work on, so I'm glad you bring this up. Um, I, I do believe that you can disprove the existence of God. Lenny, let me ask you, do you think it's possible to disprove the existence of Zeus and Thor? I, I think, yes, you can offer arguments that show that those uh, beliefs are more unlikely than likely. Absolutely. I, probably, I mean, can you definitely disprove anything? Well, you know, you, you, it's an argument from inference, so it's not a deductive argument in that in that case. But I think Zeus and Thor, are, it's a pretty good argument to show that they don't exist. Yes, so, I think you so, would be rational in holding that they don't exist. So, what would you say if somebody said to you, "You know what? I believe in Zeus, and you cannot uh, disprove me. There's I no way say, to disprove it." I, I would say. Um, well, first I'd have to ask him to define Zeus. The, the problem with Zeus is he doesn't answer any questions for us. Um, you know, you can, and, and sometimes people can equivocate what they mean by Zeus. So they say, you know, I've been to Mount Olympus, there's no gods there. Well, we're talking about a spiritual Mount Olympus and this and that. Well, that's not what Zeus actually was supposed to un we were supposed to understand and throw the lightning bolts down and things like that. So if, if there are specific definitive characteristics of Zeus, then we can go on our way and, and show why those characteristics are false, they're flawed. Uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, however, his characteristics are such that are necessary conditions in order for the universe to exist. Right, and, and also, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, I mean, can can if somebody said to me, you know, you can't disprove the idea of Zeus, I would say, come on, let's let's talk about this. Sure, we can. I mean, we can disprove the existence of Santa Claus too, and the Easter yeah. Bunny. Some people are saying you can't disprove anything. You can't disprove the Easter Bunny. You can't disprove Santa Claus. And no, I don't. I, mean, I don't believe that's true. I don't believe it's true that you can't disprove anything. That's you know, in other words, you prove a negative is what you're saying. And sometimes the claim is you can't prove a negative. Uh, that this right, right. doesn't exist. I don't think that's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, well, actually, yeah, and I, I think you could also prove, uh, 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 disprove a, a negative. I mean, I could say I don't have a, well, I, I could say I, I, I don't have a one million pound elephant in my room right here mm -hmm. or in my pocket. Yeah. You know? Right, because those are contradictory ideas, yeah. Well, and, and it's also because it's logically there's no way it would work. Logically, yeah. there's no way you can put a thousand pounds of something in uh, of an elephant into your pocket. So you know it's the same thing with God. If it, we're going to talk logically, you know. So anyway, what was the second but, part of the question? Do you remember? Oh, sorry. Well, I, I, and Tim was asking about uh, the idea of, of the rationality of God, but but God actually answers uh, problems. He actually solves problems in terms of rationality, like the infinite regress issue. You know, there has to be a start to everything. Something can't come from nothing. Uh, and uh, so we need, we need a, a, an uncreated creator in order for that to happen. Um, so, you know, the idea that things that begin to exist have causes. The idea that the universe but, but let's, is let's, finally... But let's just talk about one of those. I mean, uh, something from nothing. It, why isn't it special pleading to say everything has to come from something except for God? You know, it's a special case, you know, for God. Because he's... Because uh, again, only we're not making a special case. We're defining our terms very clearly. Only things that have beginnings have to have an origin for their beginning. Similarly, only uh, things that have two lines coming in at, an, at uh, something other than parallel will have angles. If I said, you know, go to the corner of a circle, that doesn't make any sense because circles, no. by definition, don't have corners. Right. Well, I, Only I, I, things yeah. that have beginnings have uh, a creator. I, I God doesn't have a beginning. I, so. Okay, I understand that, but why do you think something could exist without a beginning? Why not? Something has to exist without a beginning, otherwise we'd have nothing at all. 
that's the whole point. Nothing that's, out of that's... nothing, nothing comes. It's it just. I mean, it, it, because we have us, because we have the universe, there will have to be something that created it. It's no, just no, other okay, wait, why, why falling into an infinite regress. Why? Why can't the universe? Why can't the universe, like the multiverse theory? Why can't? Why can't matter? Be eternal. Why can't matter always come from? Why can't this universe be birthed from something else, just all the way back to infinity? Because that's again, that's an infinite regress, and an infinite regress answers nothing. It's it's the Earth on top of a turtle, on, uh, on top of an elephant, on top of a turtle, and you ask, well, what's the turtle standing on? Right, this is the famous Bertrand Russell thing. And but that's, you know, well, but what's that's the turtle what standing on? But that's another turtle. Another turtle. All but you're saying is, of, but isn't that what you're saying for God? It's the same thing. You no. go back. I mean. What, what no, was God, God is, doing before he did this? He was doing something else. He was. He, he, well, he wasn't doing at all because time itself didn't even exist at that point. He's. That's why God is 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 defined as a simple being. He's. Okay, but he's how could simplicity. how could how could God ever come to say, you know what? I have an idea. I'm going to make the the the. I'm going to make the whole universe. In fact, I'm going to make time. How could he, yeah. how could there be a time when he makes time if, if time didn't exist? He, well, any time. Uh, again, time is just a succession of moments, and at point at the point where God decides to create, this is what what philosophers call it's a logically prior position. It's not a temporally prior position. God chooses to create, and then that happens. Just because we can't understand it completely uh, doesn't mean it's not logically fallacious, nor is it uh, circumspect in that regard. It just it just argues that again. We know that we live in time. We know that time is relative. We know those two things are true. Uh, so the fact that God can express himself and cause time in, uh, to come into being isn't a big deal. Matter of fact, time coming into being is held on both sides of the, of the fence. The, the naturalist holds that time came into being at the Big Bang just as much as the Christian holds that the time came into being as well. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, no, at the Big Bang, I think you're talking about there's debate whether there's a singularity there or what. I mean, you know, the multiverse theory. Uh, okay, but the multiverse nobody knows, theory. Basically, nobody knows yet. Well, but, but slow down because without, because time is linked to mass and energy. That's what Einstein showed. So your, your, your mass and your acceleration have effect on your time. This is, this is why as you approach the speed of light, time slows down. I mean, this is, this is common physics at this point. Um, time is linked to matter and energy. If you are creating a universe, if the Big Bang, if the singularity is that thing that puts out all matter, energy, and space, then time has to come with it. But people don't even know if there is a singularity or not. Like uh, Hawking, I think he said there was a singularity, and then I, I think in his last book he reversed himself and said there's not a singularity there. So does he? I don't believe he's holding to the steady state model. He doesn't believe that the universe has been here forever. No, there could be a multiverse idea. But the, the Big Bang came from somewhere else. But okay, so what ran that engine? Where did the engine that starts producing the multiverses nobody, come from? Yeah, see, nobody knows. This is science. But you see, this trying is, to figure this out. It, but no, my point is, it's an infinite regress. It's like it's like me saying, "Who's the guy that's stacking all the turtles on top of each other?" You well, know, I mean, if you're if you're saying that the universe created other universes, created other universes, you got to say, well, "Where did that one come from?" It still right. doesn't answer the question. Here's the bottom line, though. The bottom line is everything. Essentially, there's really two choices. Everything came from something existing eternally, or everything um, came from nothing. Okay, and right. so those are the two ultimate choices. And the point is, neither one of those makes sense to us because, in our experience, we don't know of any cases whatsoever of anything eternally existing, such as God, and we don't also <laughs> know of anything coming from nothing. So both cases to us don't make sense. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I think I think that it's natural in all of humanity that they know that there is some kind of a creator out there. I mean, this is oh, this is through all of human history that we've held to that. So to say that that's not known, I don't think is. I, I mean, I think that's begging the question. I think that oh. that we're born with that. We're, we're, no, we assume now that. you're. Oh, that's just the reason. Why do people believe in God? I mean, that's a whole different topic. Why did why did why did humans come to make up God? I mean. That's that's a different argument. That's a whole different. There, there's a evolutionary answers for that. It's a whole different topic. Well, yeah, there is. It is a whole different topic that we have to talk about. But I but I don't think that it's as as cut and dry. Again, I don't think they're both on the same plane as you're making it out. As you're kind of. No, I'm I'm just saying from human experience, 
ultimately there's two choices. Everything we know came from nothing. Something came from nothing or else something came from something eternal. And we, in our experience, we don't know of anything that's eternal and we also don't know of anything that came from nothing. So are you saying that, well, I, I would tell you that people have experienced God directly. Uh, I, I think people do have I know. That I, I, I was there too. I was one of those guys who thought I had a relationship with Jesus and all that. Well, but just because you felt that and then you later felt that you were wrong doesn't mean that those other people who have that experience are not, necess are not right. Okay. I know, I know, I know. I'm not saying I'm not saying they're all wrong because I I have the right ideas. I mean, right. Of course, I think I'm right and they're wrong, but I'm not saying they're wrong because of that. No, no. But it, the the point is that I mean, if we can experience, and we have the you know we have the evidence of the resurrection, so we we even have bigger evidence that uh, God does uh, you know enter into our world and work with us in those regards. So we've even got that aspect of, of uh, evidence that we can claim for ourselves. Okay, so um, I guess we're done for now. So I'll give you uh, 30 seconds. I'll give you the last word. I, uh, you can summarize uh, for 30 seconds, and then we'll close. Well, I, again, I want to you know, and to address Tim's question. Uh, how do we understand what's reasonable, what's real, what's true? Um, I think uh, we've been thinking about these questions for thousands of years, and uh, at the forefront of reason really has been uh, Christian philosophers, Augustine, Aquinas, Anselm, uh, Pascal, all these great uh, thinkers who have given us strong reason to know that God is true. And uh, if you look at the arguments and really get into the nitty-gritty, I think you'll find that uh, the true reason is that person who holds to uh, God who created us. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it's been uh, kind of fun talking to you, getting to know yeah. you a little better. Uh, one reason why I do this is because uh, you know a lot of atheists and Christians they they kind of stay in their own corners for a while and they don't right. talk, and you can call each other idiots and all that. And uh, so I think it's good just to uh, to make some dialogue because you know they say you're not supposed to talk about religion and politics, right? So we we can break <laughs> those rules right. here. Well, at least okay. break half of them. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the time. Ben. All right. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Steve. Bye.